the Mexican foreign policy has changed a lot during the last uh, month and a half. During this time, we saw that the president of Cuba, uh, Diaz Canel, visited Andres Manuel López Obrador. Uh, the statements of the representative of Mexico at the OAS are really different. They're against uh, the general secretary that we were talking about, uh, Almagro. We've seen this uh, visit of the elected president of Argentina, uh, Argentina, uh, Alberto Fernandez. So, you know, this strategy, we've seen that over and over again is the same script of the State Department to create this idea that it's a national threat to the national security. It's a threat for uh, to national security in the U.S., so I'm really worried that something can happen for the next month. And it wasn't coincidence that AMLO tweeted a week ago that it's not possible a coup in Mexico, like given this idea that he's also worried. As a president, you don't start talking about a possibility of a coup in Mexico just because you have time to tweet something. I'll never apologize for the United States of America. Ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. This is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton here with Max Blumenthal, and this is part two of our interview with the Mexican journalist Alina Duarte. In the first part, we were talking about the massive protest movement going on in Chile, where there is a billionaire oligarch president, Sebastián Piñera, who is a billionaire Trumpian kind of figure, as we talked about in the first part. This is a guy who has repeatedly defended the fascist dictator Pinochet, who gave a speech uh, in 1998 opposing the extradition of Pinochet and arrest of Pinochet and saying, uh, fam infamously, he's saying, that, that Pinochet and Pinochet's family deserve all of our solidarity. So you should go to part one and you can follow what's been going on in Chile. It's a very important discussion there. This is a discussion of Latin America more as a whole, as a region. And in this part, we're going to talk about the pink tide. This is the term used to refer to the progressive wave of governments that were uh, elected in in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, of course, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Lula da Silva in Brazil, um, the Kirchners in Argentina. And we're going to talk about how some of these governments were overturned through coups, parliamentary coups, uh, elections. And it looked like the left was on the ropes. Now there's actually a kind of new hope in the region where Mexico had the historic election of Andres Manuel López Obrador, which was the, he is the first left-wing president in Mexico in 50 years. We're going to talk about how he and other leaders like Rafael Correa, the former left-wing president of Ecuador, have been trying to reintegrate Latin America and fight for a new independent foreign policy, independent of U.S. imperialism, independent of Washington's hegemony, and we're going to talk about how the massive uprisings against the neoliberal policies being implemented in places like Chile, against the austerity and the IMF loan in Ecuador, how all of these are linked to the attempt to restore, you know, independence and sovereignty to Latin America. So here is part two of our discussion with Alina Duarte. Max mentioned this insane tweet I just got up from Michael Morell, who's the former acting CIA director. He said, anyone who thinks the protests in Chile are driven by poverty and inequality, as some would have us believe, need to watch this video. This is about Cuban, Venezuelan, and Russian interference. This shows the vulnerability of even a well-functioning democracy and economy to hybrid warfare. Now, what's crazy about this, not only is this just insane propaganda, what we were talking about, but 
everyone knows the history of CIA meddling in and destroying the the actual democracy that Chile had. I mean, it's just think about what kind of sociopath you'd have to be to be the leader of the CIA and then talk about <laughs> talk about the threat to a well-functioning democracy in the country of Chile where you overthrew the elected exactly, president. Everyone, ex everyone knows that. I mean, it's the most famous CIA CIA, you know, incident in history. And then even aside from that, another thing I pointed out on Twitter here is that, so we now know this is a literal CIA talking point. You know, Michael Morell is a guy who called for killing Russians and Iranians in Syria to, quote, make them pay a price and to, quote, scare Assad. So this is a guy who he knew, he admitted in an interview that Al-Qaeda dominated the so-called rebels, and he still called for the U.S. to kill Russians and Iranians in Syria. And now... He's spreading this propaganda. Ben, what you're saying is Ben, what you're saying is that he was the CIA director. Well, no, oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, but no, but but the the other point I was going to make is that so the CIA director is spreading this propaganda, and who else is saying exactly the same thing? The OAS, Luis Almagro, the the chair, the head of the Organization of American States. He also accused the protests of being orchestrated by Maduro and by Cuba. So we have another example of how these so-called international organizations like the OAS, which act as vehicles for U.S. power in the region, are echoing narratives that are identical to the narratives being spread by CIA directors. Yeah, but I mean, at this point, who trusts Almagro? You know, it's it's another bad, bad joke of international politics. He is a real traitor, as Lenin Moreno. He was the counselor with Pepe Mujica, uh, the president of uh, Uruguay. And at this point, he's now like the spokesman of the State Department. Every in every single place he he goes, he went to the border between Venezuela and Colombia. And he was talking about human rights and that he was really, really worried about what uh, the, about the situation in Venezuela, that uh, whatever. And even, for example, this cultural idea or these narratives about what a dictatorship is and what the human rights are. For example, where all of those artists calling for a concert in SOS Chile like they did in, in <laughs> Venezuela. So now who, who can trust someone like Almagro at this point? Or who, and, you know, for example, it's, 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 it's important to say that here in Chile, they, I think that people are really aware of who is the CIA. So that's why it's really important for them to support the young people in the streets, because that sentiment of what happened in 1973, the, another September 11 in Latin America, the coup against Allende, it's, it's all, in all of the... I've been listening to the people in the streets talking about Allende, so it's amazing how this sentiment is uh, persists in, in this society. And uh, what they don't really want is to have this uh, uh, participation of someone like Almagro or the CIA or these organizations that claims uh, for uh, uh, human rights and democracy. When we see the people who are talking about democracy like Almagro or, for example, Lenin Moreno, Sebastián Piñera, who can only... Uh, have this democracy with bullets, tear gas, can uh, water cannons. It's just, I mean, it's like, who, who are trusting them at this point? Yeah, I mean, Almagro really has to get reelected at the OAS, and he's not accountable to anyone but these right-wing countries that are going to help put him over the top. Um, to the extent that their governments can hold on. And then after that, he'll probably go become a very rich man. We actually saw him at the uh, American Jewish Committee, which is a right-wing pro-Israel group uh, with that's very, very well-funded, uh, Blame uh, claim that Hezbollah operatives were active in Venezuela. I mean, he has taken this institution that was already a joke and was already a U.S. cat's paw in the region and just reduced its credibility to nothing. He's just carpet bombed the credibility of the <laughs> OAS. Uh, and what he's doing, I think, and it's understood to Venezuela, is really a more sophisticated version of Operation Condor, 
which was part you know and parcel of the coup in Chile, but also destroying the left across the continent. Um, so now we're sort of seeing the left come back um, in, 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 in some places. Um, you see the historical memory of Chile being observed through the music of Victor Jara, um, who was murdered uh, along with so many other um, supporters of Allende uh, by Pinochet. But I want to ask you, um, you know, because we only have a little bit of time left, Alina, about Mexico, where you have a government that's sort of functioning um, regionally as a kind of um, negotiator um, between the U.S. and so many of these other countries that are either, you know, uh, independent still, like Venezuela, or what you're experiencing, these tumultuous uh, protests. Um, there have been, I've, I've been hearing, you know, from Mexican friends who are on the left that AMLO has been something of a disappointment, and others, you know, understand that he's in a difficult predicament because Mexico is right next to the U.S. And I'm also seeing an attack building on AMLO within Washington to paint Mexico as a kind of failed state um, in order to get the U.S. back in. You were actually pointing to a New York Times article on your Twitter account which called for a counterinsurgency campaign in Mexico because it was a failed state. So, you know, what's happening in, you know, in your home country? How do you see AMLO? Uh, about a year into his uh, tenure, and uh, what effect is the attack in Washington having? Well, actually, it's it's. I think the the role of Mexico in the region is gonna be a key for for next years. And uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador AMLO, he's not a socialist. He he doesn't consider himself as a so socialist. He uh, he is always calling for a democracy everywhere. But he changed a lot of the a lot of uh, the things in the region. For example, we're talking about the OAS, uh, the things uh, the Lima Group. He the the position of Mexico is now absolutely different. Actually, what we were saying, the representative of Mexico at the OAS said it with the same words. Uh, he called again. He said that Almagro. He asked. To Almagro to stop being a spoke uh, a spokesman of like another cause. He she was really. I mean, I I covered the OAS for the last two years and never I heard something like that. So Mexico have been changing a lot of things in the region. And now with the relationship with the U.S., well, it's really complicated. We cannot be the anti-capitalist government that maybe we would like to see. Um, we have a lot of dependency with, with the U.S. Uh, we are the neighbors of the empire. So now I think, and I'm really worried too, because I can see that a new a new narrative and strategy from the U.S. is beginning, as we saw with Nicaragua or Venezuela. And the problem is that we are neighbors. So now Fox News and the New York Times are saying things like we are uh, uh, a failure, that our state... Uh, you know, like <laughs> the same they said about Venezuela months ago, and they are saying exactly the same now of the socialist president of Mexico. Yeah. That <laughs> that's what Fox News said, and it's important to listen to them. They are the <laughs> the real spoke uh, spokesman of of Trump. So yeah. I see that even when AMLO has been trying to be a moderate friend with Trump's administration, he conceded he it, a lot in terms of the migration policy, even when we don't say that we are the third country, the third safe country, but like we are, in fact, uh, uh, in in those terms, so even that, even with all of that things, uh, Trump's administration are still pushing the idea that now, for example, days ago he said that Mexico's government should accept the help of the U.S. to fight against the narcos, to the drug cartels, 
to fight them. And now Fox News are saying that, yeah, if we help Colombia, why we couldn't, couldn't help uh, Mexico? Oh, yeah. Help, we help yeah. Colombia so, I, so much. Success Black Colombia like, helped Colombia so much. It only made it like the most <laughs> yeah, violent exactly. country in the region. And they say it. And they say it in those terms, like, we help Colombia, so we can help anyone. So even they say, like, the Mexican population should be uh, supporting the Trump's ideas. So, you know, this strategy, we've seen that over and over again is the same script of the State Department to create this idea that it's a national threat to the national security. It's a threat for, uh, to national security in the U.S., so I'm really worried that something can happen for the next month. And it wasn't coincidence that AMLO tweeted a week ago that it's not possible a coup in Mexico, like given this idea that he's also worried. As a president, you don't start talking about a possibility of a coup in Mexico just because you have time to tweet something. So maybe he knows that things are changing. And I think a point of no return was this operative against the El Chapo's son. I don't know if you saw that, that they yeah. detained the military, the Mexican military detained the son of El Chapo. And AMLO wasn't aware about that. And I, in, in my perception, that that kind of operatives uh, or specifically that one was uh, created. It was a trap of the uh, DEA uh, in Mexico. The, yeah. So it, it, something is starting at this point. And also, you know, if you look at the history, the DEA's history in the region, um, along with Delta Force, for example, um, the, you know, operation against Pablo Escobar in Colombia, it helped turn Colombia into the failed state and create space for Plan Colombia because once Escobar was eliminated, there was this massive fight for power and the U.S. was backing Los Pepes um, as this kind of force to kill off his men. So they basically created uh, just this, this massive war in Medellin uh, that had previously kind of been under the control of one drug lord. Um, that's the kind of scenario you can see after the capture of El Chapo um, taking place in Mexico that the U.S. would sort of benefit from. Yeah, actually, the last time we received help from the U.S. to fight the, the drug cartels, we had for the last 12 years more than 200,000 people uh, disappear and more than 130,000 people killed. That was our uh, <laughs> war on drugs from 2006 uh, to 2018 for the last elections. And, um, and people are still being uh, murder every single day in Mexico because of that war. And mass media didn't say anything for more than 12 years. Where this, this war started with Felipe Calderón and things with AMLO has changed just a little because he, I mean, I understand I, I, things have to, ch have to change, but he cannot do anything. Well, he can do a lot but he kind of changed the situation in Mexico in just one year. And uh, now we have, um, he has the 70% of approval. He's trying to push a lot of initiatives, a lot of proposals of law. He's trying to change the system as much as he can, I think. Uh, but it won't be enough, I'm sure. Yeah, that. and, and let, really quickly, let's talk about... Uh, AMLO and Mexico's foreign policy and the kind of regional attempt at reintegration because today is November 7th, the 7th of November, and in the past few days there have been some interesting developments that involve not only Chile and Mexico but also Ecuador and Argentina. So, you know, in Argentina there was a, a recent election and the left won power, so the the oligarch neoliberal Mauricio Macri is now going to step, he's going to um, give power over to the left again. And the president who won, Alberto Fernandez, just actually visited Mexico. And it was actually his, his first foreign trip was to Mexico. And um, 
what's interesting is that, so CNN did a report on this and CNN asked, they said, uh, CNN, uh, CNN Español asked, they said, is Mexico the new epicenter of the left in Latin America? And what's interesting is while this is also happening, you also had a trip of Rafael Correa, who is the former leftist president of Ecuador. And he, he had a talk, he met with Alberto Fernandez of Argentina. And um, Correa also commented on the meeting between Hernandez and AMLO, the president, the new pres leftist president of Mexico. And he said, we're going to continue building Latin American unity. And then also, Correa, in his, in his interview in Mexico, he did an interview with uh, Milenio, which is a big media outlet, and he said, before Lopez Obrador in Mexico, before AMLO, Mexico only looked to the north. Mexico considered itself part of North America and saw itself as more closely allied with the U.S. than with the rest of Latin America. Now, Correa argues that now with AMLO, Mexico is looking back to the south again and at least making attempts, you know, you can criticize maybe that they're not as successful as they could be, but is at least making attempts to reintegrate with the region and no longer just seeing itself as the kind of junior partner of the U.S. So I'm wondering what you think about that and about this kind of his, these, these historic meetings, um, the, the fact that the new left-wing president of Argentina, his first trip, was to Mexico? Well, I must say that in the last month and a half, I've seen a complete, a different, a real different uh, foreign policy strategy. The Mexican foreign policy has changed a lot during the last uh, month and a half. During this time, we saw that the president of Cuba, uh, Diaz Canel, visited. Andres Manuel López Obrador, uh, the statements of the representative of Mexico at the OAS are really different. They're against uh, the general secretary that we were talking about, uh, Almagro. We've seen this uh, visit of the elected president of Argentina, Argentina uh, Alberto Fernández, the position of Mexico in the group of uh, Lime, uh, even something that wasn't uh, mentioned in the media was that in the, the Twitter account of AMLO, he said that in Bolivia, in the middle of all of this strategy of a coup against Evo Morales, he said that the elections in Bolivia uh, were democratic. So it's, it's amazing, and I think it is related to his uh, fear of a coup that he needs to change as much as possible immediately. So it's changing, and it's changing for good in the region, but that's why I'm really worried, because the U.S. won't allow AMLO to do whatever he wants, right? So, yeah, definitely it's a change, and in the middle of this chaos, um, people questioning the neoliberal model in the region, or in the whole world, in Ecuador, in Chile, He's talking about neoliberalism in, during these press conferences in the morning that he has every single day. He, he was saying that the neoliberal system is failed, a failed model that we cannot trust in those kind of policies. And it's something that he, I don't, I, I would never thought that he could say something like this. As I said, he's not anti-capitalist, he's not socialist, but he's understanding the role of Mexico in the region. And it has changed a lot during the last month or two months. And, and it's it's amazing. Yeah, I just got up this tweet you mentioned. This I'm glad you mentioned this because I was tweeting about it and it got very little attention, but I agree that this is very important. This is Andres Manuel López Obrador, the new Mexican president. And he tweeted, I'll translate it here. Um, I congratulated on the phone the new president-elect Alberto Fernandez in Argentina and also Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, who won their free election, the free and democratic elections in their countries. And then he posted a photo meeting. Um, and what's interesting is that this is also at a time, of course, when the U.S. and the OAS are leading this kind of coup attempt against 
um, Evo Morales in Bolivia, and there have been massive protests um, in support of Evo. And but what's also interesting in response to this is if you look on if you look at Twitter and you look at um, like the people who really support AMLO and what, what they call like the the um, red the AMLO red like the network of of AMLO supporters. Um, there's a, a popular AMLO guy, um, Michael Oviedo, who's like an architect and a big AMLO guy. He always, you know, people say AM lovers. They always have this thing like this is, and if you look at their rhetoric, it's really interesting. He's saying, my absolute support to my president, goodbye to neoliberalism. Another country in Latin America is turning to the left. Goodbye to the right wing that sells its homeland. Um, welcome the left. So if you, even if you look at his supporters online, there's definitely this rhetoric. And of course, when AMLO, you know, his domestic policy, it's more complicated to talk about. Uh, of, co of course, the Mexican government is, the federal government is, is a very weak state compared to other states in the region for a variety of historical regions, reasons. But I, I think this actually, he kind of reminds me in some ways of Lula da Silva in Brazil, where, I mean, Lula was more explicitly kind of socialist oriented, but in the sense that Lula was not, his economic policy was not very left-wing. Um, he did fight poverty, but he wasn't like, you know, threatening to take away the wealth of rich people. But he was explicitly anti-neoliberal in his rhetoric, and he was focused on regional integration. So I'm wondering maybe if you think that, you know, AMLO at his inauguration, he famously declared that the night of neoliberalism has ended, and there's a new dawn in Mexico. So I'm wondering maybe if you think He's definitely not someone like Chavez, who's talking about socialism in the 21st century. But do you think that, that AMLO can be someone more like Lula, who is going to be focused on regional integration and, and you know, not a socialist model, but a more social democratic model, of course, if, if he's not cooed out? Um, although another point to make really quickly is that it was actually the 2002 coup against Chavez that turned him to the left and made him a socialist. So something else to think about is if the U.S. and right-wing forces do try a coup against Lopez Obrador, it could be possible that that could act, if he survives the coup and he has a lot of popular support, that could actually move him even further left. Yeah, actually, I, I think the same, that he's more kind of a Lula than a Chavez, but actually also Chavez wasn't socialist before 2002. Uh, it was the coup that made Chavez a, a real socialist, uh, talking about okay, expropriations, about the, the bourgeoisie, about, you know, Chavez changed a lot after the coup. So even uh, Andres Manuel, I think he has been changing a lot his mind during the last year. He's not the same person who took the power last uh, December the 1st, 2018. He has changed a lot his mind and his policies, or maybe it was just a strategy taking the power and then started doing something like this. I'm really glad that something like this is going on in Mexico. Uh, and also, uh, there is something I forgot to say, and um, it's the role of Mexico now with what's going on in, in Ecuador, because um, now the mainly figures or mainly figures of uh, the Correismo or of the government of Rafael Correa in Ecuador. Now, for example, the former chancellor, Ricardo Patiño, is exiled in Mexico. Also, the one who was the president of the National Assembly, Gabriela Rivadeneira, both of them could have run for presidency instead of Lenin Moreno. But according to the polls, the best option at that moment, at that point, was Lenin Moreno. And Gabriela Rivadeneira now is inside the embassy of Mexico asking for asylum uh, with another for a congressman uh, inside the Mexican embassy. So Mexico is absolutely defying the U.S. in, in foreign policy, uh, especially in the terms of, uh, as what I said, Bolivia and in Ecuador is definitely, for example, now Rafael Correa, as you said, is, it's, is in Mexico, giving uh, speeches and uh, uh, having meetings with uh, Alberto Fernandez, the president, the elected president of Argentina. So definitely in those terms, accepting the visit of uh, the president of Cuba and talking about democracy in Bolivia and accepting uh, the main leaders of Correismo in Mexico uh, as exiled. Uh, it's, it's just 
he's not talking about uh, the throwing the capitalism, but he's doing these kind of things that represent a clear uh, that he's really defying the U.S. in, in these terms. All right. Well, we're going to have to end our conversation there. Thank you so much for joining us. We were speaking with Alina Duarte, who is an independent journalist and is currently in Chile. Uh, she used to work with Telesur. Also, Alina is crowdfunding to, to have people help support her important on the ground investigative journalism. So we're going to put a link below this episode on YouTube and also on different websites for podcasts. So go to the description and you can find the link to her GoFundMe to help support Alina's on the ground reporting. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Alina. And support us. <laughs> and support us at patreon.com slash moderate rebels. Yeah, yeah. Support all of us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thanks a lot, Alina. Thank you. Okay.